pray together. Lord, it's very plain where we're supposed to end now. All the glory is yours. All the glory is yours. All the academic glory at the university is yours. All the glory of military might is yours. All the glory of the weather systems with hurricanes and tornadoes and cyclones and floods is yours. All the glory of art is yours. All the glory of athletics and sport are yours. All the glory of science is yours. O oh God, stand forth, I pray, and receive your glory. Hasten the day when you will no longer be robbed belittled, scorned, ignored as the maker and sustainer of all things and the redeemer in your Son, Jesus. Oh, hasten the day. Come, Lord Jesus, I pray. Draw near by your Spirit now and in your risen person soon. Until then, oh God, May we, your people, render to you all glory. May we not presume to give anything to you as though you needed anything. May we not presume to counsel you as though you needed our advice. But rather, may we be ever bankrupt, ever weak, ever needy, ever thirsty, ever hungry, ever open ever empty and receiving so that you get all the giving glory. Use this message, I pray, to perform in unbelievers an awakening to Christ and in all believers an awakening to your glory as never before, I ask through Christ. Amen. Well, today we complete our six-year pilgrimage through the first 11 chapters of the Book of Romans. We began in April 1998, and tonight, today, we finish. Knowing that we're never finished with the Book of Romans, but we must finish sometime, and so we will do it today. We've seen our desperate condition as sinners and sinners of all mankind in chapters 1 through 319. We've seen the glorious work of God in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead in 319 to the end of chapter 5. We've seen the great outpouring and intervention of the Holy Spirit sanctifying us and securing us forever in the beloved and in the love of God from which we cannot be separated in chapter 6 and 7 and 8. And we've seen this massive display and defense of the sovereignty of God and His promise-keeping faithfulness in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And we saw it come to climax in verse 32. God has consigned everyone to disobedience that he might have mercy upon all, which sends Paul then, as it were, into explicit praise, explicit wonder, explicit amazement. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to be his counselor? Who has ever given a gift to God so that he could be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things? Therefore, to him and to him alone be the glory for everything forever and ever. Amen. He's, 
He's ending where we ought to be. Ending, it's very plain where we are to be at this point in our pilgrimage through Romans 9 to 11 or Romans 1 to 11. We are to be winging with the Apostle Paul in amazement at the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, which is where we were last week in the first half of verse 33. And now he wants to fly with us a little farther up and further in, all of it preparing us for chapter 12. I beseech you by the mercies of God. It ended in mercy, right? Chapter 11, verse 32. He's consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And he launches into those chapters of practical Christian living and morality. And the thing I want to point out at this point is simply this. As you make the transition from these massive foundation-laying chapters 1 to 11 and launch into the practical, give your body now as a living sacrifice to prove what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Fulfill your gifts. Let love be genuine. Live at peace with one another. Do good to your enemies. Be submissive to the government. Owe no man anything. Clothe yourselves with righteousness. Be at peace in the brethren. If one drinks this and another drinks that, as he moves into this incredibly practical life section, know this. Christian morality is driven, sustained, and empowered by a worshiping mind and heart. The link between the theology of chapters 1 to 11 and the practical morality of chapters 12 to 15 is worship. Oh, the depths! Rise with me. Be amazed with me. Stand in wonder with me so that your mind will not be conformed to this world but be transformed. Sometimes we launch into chapter 12 without realizing there's a way the mind gets transformed. It gets transformed by worship. It gets transformed by being caught up out of yourself into the heights and depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It gets transformed by being drawn up out of yourself to see the way God is. Christian morality is not a willpower religion because God has authority to tell us what to do. Christian morality is the overflow of worship in daily life so that your daily life, Paul says, becomes a living sacrifice of worship. So we're going to get there. It'll be a while yet, but know that that's the bridge from chapters 1 to 11 to your life of struggle. The bridge is a transformed mind that is not conformed to this world because it has been drawn up into God through the revelation of his ways and his judgments, yielding stunned amazement and worship. That's where Christian morality comes from. Otherwise, it's just ordinary humdrum legalism. So let's linger with Paul now in verses 30. 3 to 36. We saw last time that Paul sees depths, unfathomable depths in the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. No matter how far down you go into his wealth, no matter how far down you go into his wisdom, no matter how far down you bore into his knowledge, you never get beneath God. 
God is bottomless. His riches are unsearchably deep. There is nothing beneath God. There is nothing above God. And there is nothing decisive over against God in the middle. From Him, through Him, to Him. I don't know what dimension you have in your head when you hear that. But since He said depths, I have this dimension rather than this one. From, through, to There's nothing above him as a higher goal. There's nothing beneath him as a deeper cause. And there's nothing competing decisively with him in the middle. He is the beginning and the middle and the end in this affair of reality. And we should be in awe with the Apostle Paul. And that now takes us to verse 36. The reason it's so from him, through him, and to him is because it's so deep. And that yields now verse 35. Who has given a gift to him that he should be repaid? Answer, nobody. In other words, you can't give anything to God that's not his already. If everything is from him, through him, and to him, you can't give him anything. That's not his already, which means you can never put him in your debt, ever, ever, ever. God never owes you anything, ever. If you have anything from God, it's grace, totally. He is never bound to you by anything you offer to him. You can't enrich him. He doesn't owe you anything. He is never in anybody's debt, which leaves now an example in verse 34. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? So here's a specific illustration of what you can't give God, namely advice. Who has ever been his counselor? Answer, nobody. He has no counselors. He does all things, James, Ephesians 1, according to to the counsel of his will. God has a counselor. It's called God. And he consults with nobody but himself. You can't give God any advice. Don't try to tell him how to run the world. Which brings us now to verse 33, the second half. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. In other words, since his riches are deep and his wisdom is deep and his knowledge is deep and you can't give him anything and you can't advise him about anything, it's not surprising then that we would be often confounded and bewildered and perplexed by his ways. That's not surprising, is it? If his ways are unfathomably deep and you can't go down there because they're infinitely deep, and you're finite, and he's so rich that you can't give him anything, you're always in the position of a receiver, never a giver, and you never can give him any counsel or any advice. He doesn't consult with you at all. He has infinite wisdom in his own mind. Is it any wonder that Paul would say his ways are inscrutable and his judgments are unsearchable, meaning we are often bewildered and confounded And our mouths are shut unless we would presume to counsel him, which we shouldn't do. So to him, then, is all the glory. So I just walked through my sermon in five minutes, and now I'm going to back up and preach it. Here's the outline again. Last time we saw that The riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God are very deep, which yields point number one, all things are from him and through him, which yields point number two, you can't give God anything so as to put him in your debt, which yields point number three, a specific example, you can't give him any advice. Nobody has known the mind of the Lord in such a way as to give him any advice. Which leads to point number four. 
His ways and judgments are unsearchable, inscrutable, and our poor finite minds often bump up against perplexity, which yields the final point. Let's give all the glory to God and not try to get it for ourselves. So that's the outline. Here we go. Number one. From him and through him are all things. I'm going to save to him for the end because that's where it's all going. From him and through him are all things. I take this to mean that the ultimate origin and the ultimate cause or the ultimately decisive reason for everything is God. No exceptions. Everything is dependent for its existence on God at its beginning and all the way along, from and through Him. It comes by virtue of His ultimate causality, and it is in being because He holds it in being, whatever it is. Ephesians 1.11 puts it like this, God works all things according to the counsel of His will. All things He works according to the counsel of His will. Romans 9.16 puts it like this, So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Proverbs 16.33 puts it like this, The lot, we would say the dice, are cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. In Reno, Las Vegas, Atlantic City, Malacca. Every decision of every dice roll in the universe is from the Lord. There is no explanation for what is or what happens that is deeper or more decisive than God. That's what we mean when we say God is sovereign. The devil is not co-eternal with God and he is not ultimately independent from God. His existence and everything that flows from it, all the evil that he does, depends on God's willing him to exist. And he could snuff him out at any moment into utter nothingness if he chose. The devil exists by God's behest. I'm not a dualist, and neither are you. We do not have two ultimate beings from which flow dark and light in cosmic conflict. There is one origin from whom and through whom and to whom are all things, and He is God. God sees every wicked decision Satan makes coming. And since God does nothing capriciously and nothing whimsically, He has a purpose for letting it come and folds it into His great God-exalting design. There's always a purpose for what God causes to happen directly or permits to happen indirectly. So in that sense, even evil and the calamities of the world are included in verse 36. All things are from Him and through Him. However, 
we must be careful here. If we would take all of Scripture into account, which we should, that we not say things in an unbalanced way. To bring balance in, consider this verse, 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride in possessions is not from the Father. Hmm. But is from the world. Hmm. So, in one sense, then, all things are from him, and in another sense, not all things are from him. So what sense will we make of that? Here's my effort. I take this to mean that sin, I think that's what John is talking about, sin does not come from God's nature. That is, it's not an extension or an aspect of God's nature or character. God is holy. There is no unholiness in God. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. The darkness and the unholiness of sin does not arise as part of God's nature or character. They don't come from him in that sense. Sin can be from God and through God in the sense of ultimate, decisive cause, but not in the sense that it comes from his nature or his character. God wills that sin be without himself sinning. If I didn't believe that, I would have to believe that he would snuff Satan out of existence today. Satan will never be saved, so he's not sparing his life so that it's to give him a chance to be saved. All Satan does is causing misery. Therefore, God, for some reason, does not snuff out this sin-producing power, though he could and would do him no wrong and us much help. And he doesn't do it. And it isn't because Satan has any claim on him either. It is not sin when God, with infinite wisdom and holiness, ordains that sin exist. Sin is from God in the sense that he ordains that it be. And sin is not from God in the sense that it would be an extension of or an expression of his character or his nature. Let me give you an example. I tried my best to come up with a practical example. Children, listen and explain this one to your parents when you get home. At least ask them about it. You can get a black eye in two ways. Somebody can take a snowball, pack it down real tight, and throw it at you. I did this one time at a men's retreat hit my music minister, Dean, right in the eye. I didn't know I was that good at 40 yards. It was just totally accidental. And, but anyway, boom. And your eye will turn black. Or here's another way you can give a black eye. 
You can take a syringe, fill it with black dye, and inject it into your eyebrow and squeeze it all in there, and it'll all drain down and make your eye black. Now, the point of the illustration, and don't press it farther than the point that it can bear, is to say there are two ways by which sin can emerge. A snowball that is perfectly white can hit your eye and it turns black. Or an injection which is full of black can put it into you. And my point is, God in His wisdom and sovereignty can ordain that sin be by virtue of snowballs and not out of any nature in himself at all. The eye that is black is not black because the snowball is black. But if you inject black, then it is. And we don't have to understand how he does it. I've pled mystery all the way along in chapters 9 to 11, ultimately, when it talks about the sovereignty of of God. The darkness comes from the nature of the die in the second case, and in the first case, the darkness does not come from any darkness in the snowball at all. The practical upshot of this first point, that all things are from Him and through Him, Absolutely all things, in the sense that Paul means it here, as the ultimate cause and the decisive explanation, should make us very, very humble and very, very dependent. We should tremble that we are that utterly, utterly dependent. on God. First Corinthians 4:7, "What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? The fact that all things are from God means you can't boast. You can't boast. Point number two, verse 35. Who has given a gift to him that he should be repaid? The answer to that is nobody. Nobody. Since everything is from Him and through Him, He owns everything, and we can't give Him anything that's not already His, which means that we can never put Him, we can never put him in our debt. We have no bargaining position. We can't negotiate with God at all. There's no negotiating. We have no place from which to negotiate. We are squatters. on his property. We own nothing. It's all his. You can't negotiate. You can only, this poor man cried, and God heard him and delivered him out of all his trouble. That's all you can do. God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, for he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. There's no negotiating. There's no bargaining. There's no trading. There's no buying. There's only rebellion or trust, damnation or salvation. We are made to be receivers And God exalts Himself to be the giver, and that's a good way to be. I am very happy to be a debtor to God for all eternity. I never want to turn it around. I never, ever, ever hope, plan, or want to get to the place where I can give to God and He can be in any way dependent upon God. I will be happily dependent upon Him 
forever and ever. Point number three. Verse 34, a specific example of what you cannot give to God. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Answer, nobody. Nobody has known or understood God and his ways so as to spot a place to be improved. So you might as well keep your mouth shut when it comes to assessing God's ways and judgments if you don't like them. Paul has given 11 chapters of the mind of God. This does not mean when he says, who has known the mind of the Lord or his ways are inscrutable and his Judgments are unsearchable. He doesn't mean there's nothing about God you can know or understand. That's not what he means. He just wrote 11 chapters about the ways of God. He means for us to see the iceberg that's out of the water here and understand all of its crevices and learn from it the nature of the rest of it that's submerged in his infinity. So it doesn't mean you can't know anything about the mind of God. It means you can't know the mind of God such as to become his counselor. Nobody can advise God about anything. Now think about this for a minute. As I pondered this, it really, it really walloped to me. The one thing that Paul picks out to say we cannot give to God is the one thing that most unbelievers give God most often. Isn't that amazing? They don't give him love. They don't give him trust. They don't give him worship. They don't give him delight and satisfaction. They don't give him their time. They just give him their advice when things don't go the way they want. This is how serious things are in the world. The one thing that Paul chooses to point out we cannot and dare not give to God is what most people give him most of. Where are you? You should have shown up. Oh, how often do human beings become the advisors of God? telling him how he should have run the world, telling him how he should f fix my life and fix my marriage and all the things that God should have done differently or in the future. We can't give him any advice. We can't improve upon the mind of God. This, by the way, should really humble us in the way we pray. Prayer is asking for God to do things, right? But prayer is not becoming God. Prayer isn't saying to God, all right, uh, you don't know how to do this. You don't know how to relate to my sick child. I do. You don't know how to relate to my marriage. I do. You don't know how to take care of my niece who's not walking with Jesus. I do, and I'm going to tell you how to do it. That's, that's not the mindset of prayer. The mindset of prayer is, oh God, I have a need. She, he, we have needs. Would you come and help us? According to your word, as far as I can see, this would be a good thing to do. I ask that you do it. Sometimes he grants you a tremendous assurance that's what he wants to do, and you can pray with great faith. Other times he leaves open your mind as to whether or not that might not be his will, and you simply ask and say with Jesus, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And that's not a bad prayer because Jesus prayed it. Point four. Since everything is from God and through God and we can't give him anything, we can't be his counselor, it's not surprising then that we're going to be stumped when we consider his ways and his judgments. How unsearchable 
This is verse 33, second half of the verse. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. This doesn't mean you can't know anything, but it does mean, according to 1 Corinthians 13, now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So there's a, a modesty that comes into our minds here. We can know things truly. The Bible on every page assumes that we can know things truly, but we can't know anything exhaustively. We see through a glass darkly, and one day it will be different. Finally, number five, the conclusion. It all leads to the end of verse 36, doesn't it? To him are all things. From him, through him, yes. And now, to him, for him, to him be glory forever. Amen. So I'm going to close by asking you some questions, which I hope you, in your heart, will answer. And if you think the answer is wrong, then I hope that you will pray as I ask these questions. Do you love the thought that you exist to make God look what He really is, glorious? Do you love the thought that you exist to reflect and display the glory of God? Does that bring joy to your heart? Make you tingle? with awesome historical destiny. I am on planet Earth to make God look glorious because He is. Second question. Do you love the thought that all creation exists to display the glory of God? The heavens are telling the glory of God. Are you glad about it? When you see spring just trying to come in Minnesota, soon the branches will get little bulges, and you'll say, come on, come on. And when they come, and the hedge that you chop back so far, you wonder if it'll ever come back, gets little green things on it, and you say, God is real and living. Are you glad that it's about God? Or does that just kind of burden you that God's got to be in everything? Test yourself. Question three. Do you love the truth that all history is designed by God one day to be a completed canvas that displays the best way possible the greatness and beauty of God? That was a long sentence, long question. I'm going to try it again. Are you glad that history, from Adam to the consummation, that history is an emerging, God-painted canvas that when it is finished will be the best display possible of the full range of, of the excellencies of God. Are you glad that God is writing history as only He can write it for His glory? Fourth question. Do you love the fact that Jesus Christ came into the world to vindicate the righteousness of God and repair the injury that we have done to the reputation of His glory. When you think of Jesus, are you glad to think of Him as coming to make His Father just in the justification of the ungodly? To vindicate the righteousness of His Father and to repair 
all the injury that you and I have done to the reputation of the infinitely valuable glory of God by our daily sinning against Him. Are you glad Jesus is all about magnifying and rectifying the glory of God on earth? Does that make you glad? Or is it all about you getting out of hell and having some psychological relief from your guilt feelings and having amended marriage because God is good and Christ is merciful? Is that all that's about? Or is it about God's glory? Glory in being vindicated in the justification of the ungodly and glory in the repair of all the injury that I continue to do to the glory of God through my half-hearted love to Him day in and day out. If Christ did not mend my reproach upon God, I would be utterly undone and God would be belittled on this earth indefinitely. Last question, or maybe two more. Are you glad that your salvation is meant to put the glory of God's grace on display? Ephesians 1, 6, under the praise of the glory of His grace. Are you glad that the point of being saved is to put the display of grace out for people to see it in your life. It's all about the beauty of grace. Are you glad about that? Last question. Do you love seeing and showing the glory of God? Is the glory of God in Christ, or you can put it like this, is the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, your treasure? Is it what you love above all things? Do you love the glory of God above all things? This is why he created the universe. This is why he ordained history. This is why he sent his son. This is why he created you. This is why he saved you to see and savor and show the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the question now, at the end of Romans 11, Romans 1 to 11, is do you embrace that as your treasure, as your highest value? Do you embrace God working in all things for the glory of God as your life. Let's pray. Gracious Father, this is why we have to be born again. This is why Christianity is a supernatural faith. Because human beings have exchanged the glory of God for images. They have suppressed the truth of the glory of God and have refused to give you glory. This is, this is our nature, to hate the glory of God and love the glory of John Piper. And so I pray for miracles here that you would brood over this people and move from heart to heart and awaken a taste for glory. Oh, taste and see that God is glorious and an infinitely satisfying treasure. And he has made us for himself. Oh, Lord God, work that, I pray, in your people. Through Christ I pray, amen.